Um, the gospel, if you have your Bibles with you, here's the gospel lesson this morning. It comes from Matthew's gospel. It comes from Matthew's gospel and it goes like this. It's about Jesus. It says that um, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom of, and healing every disease and sickness. When, he, when Jesus saw the crowds, when he saw the people, he had compassion. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus was a people watcher. Anybody else here like to look at people? Like when you go to an event, you go to the fair, right? Yeah, that's what Jesus was doing. It says not just here, but in several places, that he was always looking at the crowd. He was watching them, right? And he was probably watching them in a way different than we do sometimes because uh, sometimes we watch people, right, when we're at the fair or we're at an event or we're downtown at some uh, thing. And, and, and sometimes we may not say it, but we think, say things in our head like, oh, my goodness, right? <laughs> she went out like that? Really? Why would you have that printed on your skin? I mean, that's us, right? <laughs> Not Jesus. I mean, as always, he sets this standard. It says that Jesus looked at the crowd and he had compassion. He had compassion, empathy. He felt moved because, because they weren't good. They weren't healthy. He was looking at the people saying, man, they need a leader. They need, they need direction. They need hope. They need help. He looked at all that and then he says to us, he sets that charge back then. He says, man, the needs are great. The harvest is heavy, but the laborers are few. And we need to hear that today. Jesus, way back then, said something that's true for today, right now. Remember, we started. I said God's word is timeless and timely. Jesus, Jesus looked and he said, oh, man, we're in rough shape. Man, there's a bigger need for Jesus' people. There's a bigger need for love and, and compassion and guidance and care and all those kinds of things that God gives us than ever before. The harvest is heavy, but the labors are few, is what Jesus says. Jesus sees this and he models compassion. And that's, that's a starting point today to talk about what I want to talk about, about <clears throat> loving others. You know, biblically, the word compassion means to be moved inwardly. It means to feel uh, mercy, to, to feel uh, affection and empathy for someone, to have compassion, to share their feelings of others, and to de desire to help them in their trouble. Compassion. So I'm going to be using that word, compassion. Jesus had compassion. If he had it, we should have it. Compassion. Um, it doesn't mean that anything goes. And I want you to clearly hear me on that. Because after the 8 o'clock sermon, I have a lot of different folks. I mean, this happens. People come up and they want to challenge me, right? Oh, yeah, we got to have compassion for that guy that murdered that woman downtown Dubuque. Hmm? And I have people say, what about ISIS? Is that what you're saying? We have to have compassion for ISIS? Fine. You know, it's always a great time to talk to me in between worship celebrations because you have my full attention, <laughs> right? Like, I haven't got anything to do, just another sermon. But anyway, now listen, church. I'm not talking about free-for-all. When you look at what Jesus did, Jesus modeled compassion, but he didn't say anything goes. The compassion and the love of Jesus Christ is not some kind of gooey, warm, fuzzy um, junk. Are you with me on that? If you look at that, you can see that even the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people that opposed Jesus, even the people that betrayed him, Jesus was still able to have compassion and yet hold them accountable. His disciple Peter betrayed him and, and, and uh, didn't, you know, acted like he didn't know him. And yet you can see in the Gospels that Jesus had compassion. After the resurrection, came back and he held Peter accountable. He held him responsible for his actions. So is everybody with me on that? Okay, compassion. When I'm talking about compassion today and loving others and how hard it is, I, I don't mean warm, gooey, fuzzy, rainbows and unicorns stuff, okay? I'm talking about compassion about being able to feel, being able to try and crawl into somebody else's skin. I'm talking about, at the very least, I'm talking about not wanting to hurt, harm, kill, or destroy someone. How about that? Compassion. See, we're called to do this because Jesus did it. Jesus was compassionate towards the lost people, like we just read. And he was compassionate to the people who were weary and overwhelmed by life. He was compassionate. He had compassion for the sick. He had compassion for the sinners and for the suffering and for the people that were seeking and trying to figure it out. And that is our model. Jesus modeled loving others. Jesus modeled what we, what we say in the red blocks. <clears throat> and when we say we have to love others, this is part of the system to live God strong. Jesus modeled it, period. He modeled loving 
people who were different than he was. He modeled loving the people who were less than perfect. Thank goodness, right? That means that I can be assured that he loves me. How about you? He modeled being able to love people, as I said, that didn't like him, didn't love him. He was modeling having compassion for people that disagreed with him. He, he modeled having compassion for people that even killed him, right? He's on the cross, and what did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? He's modeled. It's, it's, it's the gold standard. He sent the bench, benchmark, and that's what we're striving for, of course, um, is to model compassion or to love others. That is the charge, and that is the expectation. And you know what? It's nothing you haven't heard before. Because, man, I know preachers have been preaching this and teachers have been teaching this in the church for a long time. And I know that sometimes it's just so abstract. We come in and we sit down for an hour in these comfortable chairs and hopefully in a, a nice climate-controlled building. And so nothing out of the ordinary so far because you're hearing the preacher saying, hey, you need to get better at loving others, right? But no, really, we need to get better at loving others. And here's the truth. The truth is, is that it's really hard for us to practice showing compassion is because we're self-centered people. The problem is, is that it's, it's easier to be focused upon ourselves, right? We learned that when we were a baby. Have you ever seen a baby practice compassion? Anybody? You've spent any time with a baby? What's the baby care about? Feed me, change me, put me to sleep, hold me. I don't care what's going on for you, mom or dad. If I got, about got this right, Carrie, if I got, about got that right. Noah's a good boy, but he's kind of into himself, isn't he? That's all right. Yeah. See, we all were that way, and my point is we carry that with us, and um, we, we take that with us. And so to, to, to grow and to mature, and especially to be part, some, you know, part of the Jesus tribe, means that we have to overcome that. And I'll say it again, it's, it's easier to be self-centered, and it's easier to be focused upon ourselves and what we want and what makes us comfortable than it is to have compassion for others. And this is just the truth. It doesn't mean we're rotten, bad, no good people going to hell. It means that this is the human condition. And I would go further than that and say that what's our default setting is that it's so much easier to be focused upon and to care about and to tolerate and to be forgiving and to be caring for people that look like us and that think like us and who act like us and who have the same kind of ideologies and theologies and the same kind of golden idols that we have. Still with me, church. That's the truth. And, and, and you know, I've got to say it. I know it's true for me, and I figure it's got to be true. If it's true for me, it's got to be true for... Well, actually, every other one of you in this room, it is, if your heart's beaten and you're drawn in oxygen, is that this is our human condition. It's the way it is. I mean, look, even the disciples did this. I always think about the disciples. Um, you know, they followed Jesus around. They were, they were with Jesus. They were with Jesus. They were with Jesus. You with me? And, and, and even they didn't get it, right? I, I, think, about, I think about this, you know. Um, what, what do you see up on the screen? What are those pic images of? What, do you, what is it? Loaves and fishes, right? Loaves and fishes story. Jesus just taught 5,000 people. 5,000 people. He just taught 5,000 people, right? And it's about what was left at the Kinnick Stadium after the Hawkeyes were just winning, blowing people away. Did anybody watch that game? They showed the stadium like in the fourth quarter, and there were like 15 people there, right? And um, so there were 5,000 people that Jesus taught, and, and the disciples, maybe, maybe, they were, they were being compassionate because they went to Jesus and they said, hey, hey. You need to send all these people away. We're out here in the country. To, you know, send them away. It's going to get dark. And we need to go rest. And we need to eat. And Jesus, it says that Jesus had compassion on the people because he looked at the 12 disciples and said, well, why don't you give them something to eat? And the disciples said, what? Are you crazy? We can't. You know how much that would cost? And then, of course, we know what happened is that the, the miracle of the loaves and the fish. And so here's my point. Even the 12 chosen disciples struggled to see beyond themselves, as we do. They struggled to see beyond their circle of friends that for the most part acted like them, looked like them, maybe even smelled like them, and liked the things that they liked, and that is our challenge. See, the truth is, is that loving other people and being compassionate towards other people is really hard. It's really hard work. It, it, it's, it's somewhat easy to do when you come into this place. We all come in together. We're here for an hour, an hour and a half, right? Everybody's supposed to be on best behavior in church, right? It can be kind of easy to love other people here, but what about at Walmart, huh? What, what about, you know, if you have children in school, what about, you know, when you interact with other parents? What about, what about is, it, is it easy to love other people when you read the things you read in the newspaper or see them on the news and you see what's going on in our world? I'm going to say it again, it's really hard. In fact, I would say 
that this call for Jesus' people to practice compassion and to practice love, and in our first step not be condemnation, our first step not be hate and anger and division and to destroy someone. I think this is really hard right now in our culture, in our world, because my opinion is, is that I think we are living in times. We are living in a time in our world where we as a people in this country are more divided than I've ever seen before. Now, that's my opinion. And let me tell you why I think it's an informed opinion. Is that for 30 years, I've been a preacher for 30 years, and part of the training to be a preacher and to preach every week, the training and, and, and to do that, you have to observe. Does that make sense to everybody? I've been taught to observe, to observe what's going on in culture. Go back 30 years, and so I'm going to say it again. In my observations, we are more divided and broken and divisive in this country than any times I've ever seen. In fact, I go that next step. We are living in polarizing times. We are living in in times every single day where it seems that people are more and more and more sharply and clearly divided, clearly divided on things and intolerant intolerant, hateful, angry for people who have a different opinion. Now think about that for a minute. What I'm observing are that people, it's it's like you're not even allowed to just have a different opinion, a different opinion about something. It's like like in our country, we've, we've somehow got this idea that our opinion should be the law of the land, and instead of understanding, it's just our opinion. Amen? Are you with me? Sorry, I don't mean to rant and preach. But this is... This is the truth as I know it. The truth as I understand it is that we're living in times right now where people with different opinions and different beliefs, the division seems to be growing worse daily. That we're living in an atmosphere where if you don't agree, somehow we are encouraged, we are taught, we are, um, we are shown that we need to destroy and demonize people who don't agree with us. We live in a time We live in a time when people are just offended at the drop of a hat. Does anybody else notice this? I mean, look, I've been been doing this uh, church gig, like I said, for 30 years, and and I've always gone in and and, um, tried to change things and move things, so I'm kind of used to offending people. Are you with me? Right? It goes with the job. However, I'll say that in the last five years, even I've seen an increase in the number of people that that suddenly are so self-righteous, and that offends me. And I'm seeing it not just in my own life, but in this country. And I'll say it again. We are divided in this country. We live, we are swimming in a water. We're swimming in a culture right now of division. We're swimming in a culture of division by what? Let me give you some more examples. What am I talking about? How about immigration? You think there's some different opinions about immigration in here? Whether it's illegal, legal? Yep. That's dividing us. What about social services? What about social services and things like um, Social Security or Medicaid or or, or unemployment benefits or or, or food assistance? Does that divide us? Yes, it does. What about man-made global warming or whether it's man-made or or it's climate change or whatever? Does that divide us? What do you think? Yep. Wall Street, Main Street, taxes, sexuality, race. We live in a time right now, church, and it has to be addressed where we are more divided, I believe, than any other time. And not just divided over a difference of opinion, but we're ready to go to war and go to the mad about it. Is it it, if somebody doesn't agree with our opinion, we have plenty of names to call them, don't we? We have plenty of ways to demonize them and tear them down. This is the culture we live in. And at the very least, you've probably already connected the dots and said, my goodness, Jesus' people aren't supposed to act that way because Jesus modeled for us what? Compassion and love and loving others. And I already established it doesn't mean a free-for-all. It doesn't mean we have to like everybody. It doesn't mean we have to be best friends with everybody. It doesn't mean we can't have our own beliefs. But understand the maturity and the the mature Christian response of Jesus' people is being, being able to still love somebody that has a different opinion than yours. Can you do that? It's hard, isn't it? Because, see, our culture tells us not to. I actually believe this. I think that we are living in a time, church. We're living in a world where we have moved beyond seeing seeing people as human beings created by a loving God. We've moved beyond seeing people as human beings created by a loving God to seeing and responding to people 
only by their claim of identity and idolatry or ideology. That's what I believe. Is it's like blinders. It's like a, 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 a defective pair of glasses that we're wearing in our culture and our society right now. And we're not seeing people. We're seeing people only by categories. Upper class, underclass. Conservative, liberal, progressive, socialist, Democrat, Republican, illegal immigrant, immigrant, gay, lesbian, transgender, white, black, American, Mexican, oppressor, victim, pro-gun, anti-gun, pro-abortion, anti-abortion. You see what I'm saying? See, do you hear all those positions? Do you hear all those identities? Do you hear all those things that we attach to ourselves or attach to others as a way to demonize, destroy, and say we're different? All those things are ideologies and opinions. And sadly, they have become for many people idols, like a golden calf that people dance around, that people dance around and, and everything, including relationships. If they don't agree with it, they've got to be pushed to the side. I have watched this in the United Methodist Church for all these years, and I have watched people I love and people I care about that have made things like ordination of, uh, of gay and lesbian pastors into a golden idol, and they've turned it to say, if you don't agree with us, if you don't wear the rainbow flag, or if you don't march lockstep with us, then you must be stupid and a racist and a whateverist. Do you see what I'm saying, church? I believe that we in our culture, even in the church, have moved beyond being able to see as Jesus saw. We've moved beyond being able to look at the people as human beings created by a loving God to only being able to see people based on their stance, their identity, their ideology. And not only does this make me sad, but I think that we need to do something about this. Because Jesus said the harvest is heavy and the laborers are few, and if Jesus' people won't step up to the plate, if the people who claim to be followers of Jesus won't go forth and practice compassion and, some yes, some tolerance and some understanding, who's going to? Who's going to? Miley Cyrus and MTV, you think they're going to lead the charge on this? I don't think so. That's why I'm talking about it. So many people seem so ready to fight and to argue and to demonize and to be offended because somebody doesn't agree with them. It's hard to love other people. It's hard to have compassion when we're swimming in this water and we're told and we're encouraged and we're even expected to pick our identity and then to demonize and destroy those who disagree. On Thursday night, I was having dinner with my daughter, with Emily. I was over in Cedar Falls and, and uh, <clears throat> texted her and said, hey, I'm coming through from Des Moines. Why don't we get together and we'll eat? Okay, so we got together and we're having dinner and we're talking. And I said, hey, I expect you to be in church Sunday, right? You know, okay. You know, what are you preaching about? And I told her what I was going to preach about. And her immediate response only confirmed what I'm talking about here, that we live in a society that people are scared and they're afraid and they're worried because of our identities and our ideology. And I said, well, I'm going to preach about how all lives matter to God. And Emily's initial response, remember, she's 19, she's, a, she's in, in college, she's at UNI. She said, oh my, Dad, are you sure you want to do that? Because I think people will call you a racist. Really? I said, really, you think? Really, you think I'm the pastor of Grandview? I mean, I, I don't, you know, don't think I'm racist. You think people would call me that? I mean, I, I, I spend time, effort, energy, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, going over to Nigeria, I know, to help all those white people. <laughs> That's sarcasm, sorry. <laughs> but you see, when I said to Emily, I want to talk about All Lives Matter because, because, see, I think one of the examples, one of the examples of what's wrong with us in our society, is illustrated by that. This is just one example. When I read several months ago that Martin O'Malley, who's running for president, um, and uh, uh, he, him, and then the college president of Smith College, uh, both of them, both of these people, kind of high-profile people, they made these horrible, terrible mistakes. And I was reading about this, how they said something and they had to apologize, do penance, and, and all this writing about how it's hurt their credibility. Because these two people, Martin O'Malley, presidential candidate, co college president of Smith College, said, all lives matter. They said, all lives matter. And specifically, the folks that are very much into the Black Lives Matter movement were deeply offended. 
not just offended, but wrote letters and got on Twitter, and, and there were just like almost riots, like, how dare you say all lives matter? And this is just an illustration of what I've been talking about up to this point, is that I, I read that, and I heard that, and I thought, look, look, come on. Is God looking at us and looking at us as a society and saying, I think you people have lost your minds. You're going to start weighing out which lives matter and which don't. Blue lives matter, black lives, white lives. And somebody says all lives matter and they're taken to task for that. And people are offended by that. And people write in and say, uh, that, just, that just sucked the life out of me. And you're just not... You're just, you're just not um, giving any kind of love and any kind of compassion towards black people's experience when you say all lives matter. And I just read that and I'm looking back going, you've got to be kidding me. Look, do black lives matter, church? Yes. Are you with me? So do white lives and Asian lives and Mexican lives, and Latino lives, so do gay lives, and straight lives, and transgender lives, and so do Jewish lives, and so do Muslim lives. So, so do all creatures created by a loving God do their lives matter, and that's where I'm going to make my stand on that. And if that makes me a racist, then I think it just proves what I've been saying, that we live in a broken society that can't respect God's people for being God's people and having an opinion that's contrary to yours. If somebody walks out of this church today and says, can you believe that racist sermon Pastor Tom gave? I'm going to say, I don't think you were listening. And I'm further going to say, I think you're just trying to stir the pot and cause trouble. Further, I think that we may have a different opinion about this, but how sad that you can't practice some of that love and compassion and being Jesus' people over an ideology. So I look at this, and as I said, I can't believe that God can bless His people who keep drawing distinctions and lines and separating and finding ways to hurt and to harm and finding ways to be separate and out of communion. See, we're told, I guess this is where I come down, that God so loved the world that He sent His Son, Jesus. And the first part of that's the most powerful part for me, church, is that I look at that and say, for God so loved the world, all lives, in other words, all lives matter to God, and I believe that. I believe that. You don't have to believe that. I'll still love you. But I believe that all lives matter, the black, the white, the straight, the gay, the conservative, the progressive, the drug addict, the alcoholic, their lives matter to God. I believe that. I believe that the, that, that the person that's been divorced three times and the adulterer and the liar and the gossip and the arrogant and the, the, the atheist and the agnostic, I believe their lives matter. I do. Because I believe they were created by a loving God. I believe, as I've already said, I believe that American lives matter just like I believe Nigerian lives matter. And I believe that Iranian lives matter. And I believe Muslims, Jews, Hindus, I believe their their lives matter to God. And so what I'm trying to say to you today and say to myself and remind myself of is that living God's strong lives is saying, I'm going to be strong in the Lord and I'm going to do my best to be like Jesus every day. And so here's the scoop. If all lives matter to God, then they should matter to us, is what I believe. If all lives matter to God, then what's our problem? See, the people who claim to be and strive to be God's people, I'll say it again. If we're not leading the charge in shining the light of compassion and love and respect, if we're not doing that, who's going to? And how dare we really take that name Jesus if we stoop to that level to demonize, to destroy, to divide, to hate somebody that disagrees with us. So I invite us in our work. We have work to do. Jesus said the harvest is heavy. In our work to really authentically live as God's strong people, may God help us. May God help me. May God help you to live more compassionately and more lovingly. May God help us because we can't do it by ourselves. Let me say that again. None of us are able to live like Jesus and act like Jesus on our own power. We need God for this. Because having compassion is hard. And loving others is tough. 
So let's pray about that. Lord God, you know our condition. And I pray for your mercy and I pray for your strength. I pray that you really truly help us to live differently than the rest of this world. I pray, I pray for your help in this, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we say in one voice out loud, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.